without further ado, let us achieve justice. Hear ye, hear ye, Freedom Fest Court is now in session for this important trial to determine whether a policy of open borders for legal or illegal immigrants is good or bad for our country. Our judge for this trial is publisher and science writer Michael Shermer. Dr. Shermer is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and the host of the podcast, The Michael Shermer Show. What an appropriate name. For 18 years, he was a monthly columnist for Scientific American. He is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Why Darwin Matters, Heavens on Earth, Giving the Devil His Due, Reflections of a Scientific Humanist. Dr. Shermer received his BA in psychology from beautiful Pepperdine University and overlooks the Pacific Ocean. It's really fantastic. Uh, his master's in experimental psychology from Cal State Fullerton, really arguably the best of the Cal State schools, and his PhD in history from Claremont Graduate University. For over 10 years, he was a presidential fellow at Chapman University. All rise for your judge, Michael Shermer! Down Mexico way. That's where I fell in love when the stars above Wait. came out to play. <laughs> All right, here we go. Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, we're gathered here in the great city of Memphis in the volunteer state of Tennessee. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, to determine if the open border policy of the United States is a good idea, that it attracts entrepreneurs, new talent, and foreigners willing to work hard, pay their taxes, and contribute to our culture and way of life? Or is our open door policy overwhelming our state's social welfare programs, the drug war, criminal justice, our educational system, and changing the balance of our electorate toward a bigger and more intrusive government. According to some estimates, there could be more than 20 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. What should be the best policy to pursue with regard to allowing foreigners to enter the United States? Defending the rights of people everywhere to decide where they live and on what terms is Dr. Catherine Bernard Dr. Bernard is a criminal defense attorney with the law firm Bernard & Johnson and founder of the Spartacus Legal Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. She's a passionate advocate for protecting people's constitutional rights. She received her JD degree from the University of Virginia and was a public defender of indigent clients and a practicing attorney in civil litigation in downtown Atlanta. Dr. Bernard, will you please stand? Dr. Bernard, you, you must stand while I read the charges against you. This is serious business here. <laughs> you are accused of supporting an open border policy. Oh, you're one of those. I've seen you on Fox News. That has led to an unsustainable burden on our social welfare and educational system. An increase in crime and the drug war and a deterioration in our culture. How do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Along with my distinguished witnesses, I will be showing today that an open border policy is the most humanitarian way to uphold the principles and ideals of our republic, and when properly administered, is a boon to economic growth and the strength of our entire society. Whoa. Sounds like you won already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you guys aren't the jury. <laughs> Wait till you hear from Dr. Okay. Heldon. Okay. We will begin this proceeding with a five-minute opening statements. First, from the prosecuting attorney, Larry Elder. Larry Elder is the sage of South Central. A New York Times best-selling author, award-winning documentary filmmaker, and one of the best-known media figures in America today. His flagship daily radio program, The Larry Elder Show was heard every weekday in all 50 states and in more than 300 stations. I'm from LA, so I used to listen to that. Drive time LA, five o'clock, here comes Larry Elder, all right. Loved it. 
Larry was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles. His father served in the United States Marine Corps during World War II, and his mother was a clerical worker for the United States Department of War. Remember when it used to be called that? Now the Department of Defense and raised three boys at a, as a stay-at-home mom. After running for governor of California in 2021 and securing millions of votes, Larry is now ready for the next step in his journey. He is running for president of the United States in 2024. All right. <laughs> Mr. Elder, welcome to the Freedom Fest Court. After their opening statements, each attorney will call two witnesses who will be subject to cross-examination. Afterwards, the jury will rule on the, seat, on the case, and if the defendants are found guilty, the judge will impose a harsh sentence. <laughs> Not that I'm biased one way or the other. <laughs> I am neutral. Okay. Speaking of which, jury, let me instruct, give you some instructions. You have been selected because you have pledged to be an impartial observer who has not made up his or her mind about immigration issues. You will listen carefully to the opening statements and the testimonies of the witnesses, and at the end of this hearing, you will be required to determine whether there is sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, let me pause on that for a second. There's two standards of evidence. There's preponderance of evidence, which is, as they say, 50% plus a feather. You gotta go more than that. Preponderance of evidence is like way more than just half. These were two conflicting arguments. Could have gone either way. I like this one slightly better than that one. You got to do better than that. To convict her, they have to have really strong arguments. Okay? All right. <laughs> uh, so the decision will be based on a majority vote. This, they don't, you don't have to be unanimous, just the majority <coughs> of you. Uh, and uh, is that understood? Okay. All right. Because I heard some mumblings in the jury room about uh, opinions already determined. You have not made up your mind, right? Okay. I'm looking at you, sir. I heard you gr <laughs> Death penalty for parking tickets. <laughs> okay. By the way, as a p parenthetical note, do you like my, my, my robe? My, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the last time I wore this at this, it, this special occasion, I had a bag of cocaine and it's missing. So if anyone uh, knows what could have happened to this. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Mr. Elder, you may begin with your five minute opening statement. I have a stopwatch on that. And I'm instructed by our leader, Mark Skousen, to enforce that five minutes. Go. Judge Dr. Bernard, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution grants Congress the responsibility to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. This is clear. Article 4, Article, Section 4, Article 4 says the government shall, quote, protect each of the states against invasion. At one time, Democrats, Bill Clinton, Harry Reid, Barack Obama, Dianne Feinstein, Chuck Schumer, all railed against illegal immigration, even using the term illegal alien. And that was then, unlike now, where at that time most of the illegal aliens were Mexicans who were walking across the border. Right now, you cannot get across the border unless you pay money to a cartel. The border is even more dangerous than it was back then when these Democrats railed against illegal immigration. Peter Beinhardt is a liberal wrote an article in 2017 about how the, quote, Democrats lost their way on immigration and pointed out that there is a political reason why they switched. And the reason is simple, for votes. They determined that the growing Latino population allowed the Democrats to secure more votes. That's how cynical this is all. Numbers matter. As you pointed out, Judge, we always hear that there are 11 million illegal aliens, 13 million illegal aliens, when in fact, a study from Princeton puts the numbers at over 20 million. It may even be as high as 30 million. This is relevant because in the mid-80s when Ronald Reagan did amnesty, the assumption was 1.5 million illegal aliens would sign up for it. The number ended up being twice that. So we have no idea how many illegal aliens are here, but I assure you it's far more than 11 million. I mentioned the crisis today. When Jay Johnson, Obama's DHS secretary, was in power, he said, if across my desk there are 500 attempted illegal entries, yesterday I'm having a good day. If there are 1,000, I'm having a bad day. There are now over 5,000 a day, and that does not count so-called gotaways. 
the cost. Illegal aliens consume large amounts of government benefits, whether health care, if only to go to an ER room. When you go to an ER room, anybody that walks into an ER room will be treated irrespective of his or her legal status. By law, they can't even ask you whether or not you're here illegally. Same thing with K through 12. According to the Supreme Court, if a kid wants to go to a public school, you cannot ask him or her about their legal status. And as a result, we're spending a lot of money. It is estimated at $150 billion a year, every year on illegal aliens, when you include all the health care costs, ER costs, education costs. The group most hurt by illegal aliens are the very black and brown people living in the inner city that the left claims that they care about. Why? Because most of these illegal aliens have little or no education and they compete against people with high school or less education living in the inner city. And given how poor the quality of education is in the inner city, this is particularly critical. There are, just to choose one city, Baltimore, 13 public high schools in Baltimore where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. Another half a dozen where only 1% can. That's half of all the public high schools in Baltimore where either 0% or only 1% of the students can do math at grade level. Against whom are they going to be competing? They'll be competing for jobs against unskilled, uneducated, illegal aliens. One study done by the Civil Rights Commission estimated that there are a million fewer blacks working because of, because of the availability of legal alien labor, and illegal alien labor puts downward pressure to the tune of almost $2,000 per year on the salaries of black and brown people. Coretta Scott King once wrote a letter to Congress where she complained because Congress was about to water down the sanctions against employers who knowingly hire illegal aliens. She was nobody's conservative. Barbara Jordan, a Democrat from Texas, headed up a commission where she talked about the impact of illegal immigration on black people working in the inner city, and she said it was negative, and she came up with schemes to deport those who were here illegally. Crime. You're going to hear from the other side that it is not true uh, that illegal aliens commit more crime than do, non, uh, than do citizens, uh, and, it, and what you hear will very likely be false. What they do is they lump legal with illegal. It is true that legal Im immigrants are less likely to commit crimes uh, than people living here before, but when you look at illegal immigration, it's a whole different ballgame. And one of the reasons studies say otherwise is because when someone's arrested, generally speaking, we don't know what his or her legal status is, sometimes until years later, because of sanctuary states like California, they do not report uh, illegal aliens to ICE because they don't want them to be deported, so they are understated. Plus, many illegal aliens prey on the illegal alien community, and the illegal alien community is afraid to report the crime to the police for fear that they will be deported. So frequently, the studies underestimate just how much crime is committed by illegal aliens. Then there's the issue of culture. We often talk about the economic impact of illegal aliens. What about culture? What about ideology? People coming from countries where government is expected to provide goods and services are likely to vote for that very same thing in America, which therefore Wrap changes up, the culture of America. Finally, one last thing, the cynical nature of all of this. We would be having this discussion if illegal aliens turned residents, turned citizens, voted Republican. The answer is absolutely not. It's the assumption that eventually there'll be enough pressure put upon both sides that they will do some sort of amnesty, and at that <clears> point it'll change the nature of this country, which right now is 50-50, and, and add millions of, of, of Democrats to the ranks, which is why the Democrats cynically support open borders. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Elder. Now we will hear from Dr. Catherine Bernard, the defendant attorney of this case. I will give you an extra 43 seconds. You got five <laughs> minutes and 43 seconds. Here we go. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury for being here and for your service today on this tremendously important day uh, in, I suppose, my life and the life of my witnesses since we have put ourselves up here to support open borders. Now, what is open borders? Are we actually some crypto Marxists here to undermine the very foundation of our republic? Absolutely not. And what you heard from Dr. Elder shows exactly why the definition of open borders is what matters. It's become a political football for whatever the Democrats want to do with their mass migration and refugee resettlement. So when we look to the Constitution, when we look to its rules about naturalization, it's important to note it does not specify that the federal government has the authority over immigration, but rather naturalization. Open 
open borders isn't saying anyone should be able to come here and become a citizen and vote and receive any government benefits and participate in those civic duties that a citizen is responsible for. It is merely saying that when individuals can freely move their labor, their contracts, their ability to voluntarily interact with other humans, that we become stronger as a nation. Our entire republic was founded on the notion of being a respite from the rest of the world, from places that have had oppressive governments that have taken away people's rights. And from the beginning of our country, the people who looked around their own country and thought, you know, I want something better. I want to go to the land of the free and the home of the brave, and I am willing to put it all on the line to go and do that. Those are the people who have come to join us in our markets. Some of them might ultimately become American citizens. Some of them may come to, may choose to come here and innovate and enrich our society in other ways. But the point is that allowing government, allowing big government to determine who can be an American is not going to produce the best results. And to see why that is the case, you need only look to any other issue we have faced as a country. Education has gotten manifestly worse since the federal government took control and centralized it in a bureaucracy. Same with our currency, same with our justice system. The more big government control you have, the more socialist principles you allow to determine the interactions of free human beings, the worse results you are going to have. And so Dr. Elder speaks the truth about many of the bad results that you are seeing, particularly in places like California. And I have tremendous sympathy for people who have been living under decades of big government policies that have distorted our immigration policies to the point where, yes, there are people who are being controlled by the drug cartels. It has become profitable to try to use human beings as currency because of our immigration policies. It is something that is within our control as we set the laws and so we don't have to live in a world where simply crossing a border makes you a criminal. We don't have to choose that world. But when we do choose that world, as unfortunately our government has done over the past decades, you are going to see some negative results, especially in communities like California. So I would ask you to remember the words from the Bible. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. These sentiments are part of the very spirit that has animated our republic. And so it, it it crushes me to hear that the policies that, frankly, we're going to pick on Democrats a little bit here, but big government Democrat policies have been horrible for native-born Americans, for individuals who want to come and participate in our society. Perhaps they've come and they've gone to college here. They've gotten a graduate degree, and yet our restrictive immigration policies have forced them to return to another country. And that is a double loss, a triple loss. It is a loss for that individual who no longer is is able to take advantage of free markets and the opportunity to make a better life for themselves and their family, but to the individuals here in the United States who have lost out on driven, smart, intelligent people who can make wonderful Americans, whether they choose to pursue the citizenship path or not. So I think as you consider, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, whether to find me and my fine witnesses guilty of subversion of our American Republic, you keep in mind that burden of proof that the judge has given you. We are, it is government that is on trial here, really. It is decades of distorted policies by the politicians named by the prosecutor here who did not have the best interests of the American people at heart. They wanted control and they imposed control and that is what has le uh, led to the results that we now see on the border. It is this patchwork of unfortunate restrictions that has created a police state at the border that is now pushing its way into the rest of the United States. So whether you are concerned about the humanitarian aspects of making sure that as many human beings as possible have access to freedom and liberty, or whether you are concerned for the geopolitical strength of the United States of America and recognizing that it is best served when we have the strongest and best people from around the world on our team, 
I believe that you will find us not guilty of what the court is asking you to do, and you will recognize that in order to preserve the great principles and ideals of our republic, you will reject the centralized socialistic control, the unconstitutional notion that the government should be the sole arbiter of who becomes an American. Thank you. All right. Two very passionate opening statements. Mr. Elder, you may now call your first witness, for which you have five minutes. I call to the stand Mr. Jim Garrity. Please place your left hand, <laughs> Mr. Garrity, on a copy of this book, Open Borders, Inc., who's funding America's destruction by Michelle Malkin. Do you swear that you will tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you, Joe Biden? <laughs> I thought we were supposed to swear on a holy book, not a holy terror, but I swear <laughs> to tell the truth. Well done. Have a seat. I'll be over here. Mr. Garrity, what is your occupation? I am the senior political correspondent for National Review because that's what you call a political correspondent who gets old. <laughs> Mr. Garrity, the question before the court is open borders. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize a distinction between legal and illegal immigrants? And if so, what is that distinction? Oh, first of all, not only do I recognize it, I think it's at the heart of this debate. Every year since the millennium, the United States has given out green cards to anywhere between 700,000 people to about 1.2 million at the peak. Now that is by far, that green card is a key step on your road to citizenship. Uh, at that point, you can do everything almost short of vote in elections. You can serve in the military. Uh, you can get citizenship within five years, three if you've gotten married to a US citizen. And uh, that is by far the most that any country allows in. Uh, I believe the estimate right now is that the US has 60 million total immigrants. They don't specify between legal and illegal. That would, if the number 20 million is accurate, that means we have about 40 million legal immigrants in the country. Uh, if it's on the lower end, we're closer to the, you know, 49 million. Uh, I looked up the country that has the second highest is Germany with 15 million, mm -hmm. meaning that the U.S. has about 35 million more legal immigrants in, in than any other country. It is, is it a long process? Yes. Is it an arduous and paperwork-filled process? Yes. But I think there's a pretty significant reward at the end of that process. Mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that if you feel like the U.S. is unfair and makes it difficult to become a legal immigrant to the United States, look at any other country on the planet, and it's not even close to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's you know, a demonstration that uh, this is not a xenophobic country. This right. is not a country that hates immigrants. And if anybody accuses me of that, look, I've heard the argument that immigrants do jobs that Americans won't do. Well, I'm married to an immigrant. And as far as I could tell, no native-born Americans wanted to do that. So that counts. <laughs> and and, and, the, <laughs> and the point you're making is, is despite the implication by the, uh, by the other side, uh, America is quite a generous nation when it comes to accepting uh, legal immigration and even illegal immigration compared it to the is, rest of the world. And, and I think that's why we have a reasonable expectation for those who want to come here to come in and follow the rules. I have no doubt that some of the people who are attempting to sneak over the border, could they be good Americans, citizens? Absolutely. But I don't think if you love a country, your first act can be to violate its laws. And the other thing that kind of troubles me, look, I've, a couple of years ago, Donald Trump was up on a stage, and he was announcing his presidency, and he began, you know, they're sending the worst, they're sending the rapists, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I don't think- It's not a bad impression. Uh -uh. <laughs> Larry, I've had a lot of time to practice it. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to exaggerate it, but I do want to get how accurate numbers, and as a so-called expert witness, I decided to go look this up. This is according to Customs and Border Patrol, uh, fiscal year two thousand, uh, 2022, the United States uh, Bus Customs and Border Patrol arrested 1,142 people coming over the border who had previous convictions for assault, battery, domestic violence. 896 for burglary, robbery, larceny, theft, fraud. Uh, 1,614 people who had previous convictions for driving under the influence. 62 for homicide and manslaughter, that's the big one. 
Uh, there are a couple of on illegal drug possession, but I realize this is a libertarian-leaning conference, so I'm going to skip over that. I know you guys have no problems with that. Uh, <laughs> illegal weapons possession, you guys are pretty cool with that, so I'm not going to go there. But 365 for sexual offenses. Now, I, you know, the opposition had made a very good point about the uh, inefficiencies of the federal government. I wrote a book called The Weed Agency a few years ago, a portrait of the federal bureaucracy. Look, I get it. The government has all kinds of flaws. I'm not expecting perfection. I don't think the day is ever going to come when we get these numbers down to zero. But I'd like to get them as close to zero as we can possibly get, which is going to require a little bit more border enforcement trying to prevent these people from coming into the country in the first place. If you are, you know, I have no doubt there are good folks who want to come across that border, but we need to have a system to weed out the ones who are generally bad people, who are generally go, uh, general, genuine threats to the country and who want to infringe your individual rights. One minute. Okay. Of the five estimated million illegal aliens who are now in our interior since the Biden administration has been in office, do you have any idea how many have been on the terror watch list? Any estimate on that? Ah, good you ask that. So the short answer is there's a small minority, but they are there. Um, and I think that's another factor of like, I'd really like that number to be as close to zero as possible. Uh, if you come to the border, you know, I, I'm much less worried about those who come here on a legal entry and they overstay their visas. I'd prefer those people did get eventually uh, had the law catch up with them. But generally, if you've gotten in here and you've taken out your passport, we have checked and make sure, okay, you're not a member of Al Qaeda, you're mm -hmm. not a member of ISIS, you're not someone who's here planning to blow up the Statue of Liberty or something like that. L last question, there are eight billion people in the world how many of them do you think would come here if they could come, and if they could all come, would it matter? Off the top of my head, I don't know that percentage, but I do know that, and they asked uh, in a whole bunch of different countries, which country would you most like to immigrate to? Unsurprisingly, it was the United States of America. I think it was Matt Iglesias who wrote a book in envisioning one billion Americans. Uh, he's an advocate, effectively, for open borders, and effectively, not just a path to citizenship, I think he wants a drive-through lane to get them citizenship as quickly as possible. Um, I, I think, you know, look, the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser, recently said when they were just dealing with all of these refugees, dealing with all of these you know, buses that were being shipped up here, that they just don't have the resources in Washington, D.C. to handle all this. They're not a border state, as if El Paso is just deal teeming with resources and has so many things that they can deal with this. Um, the, Biden, a couple, the Biden administration uh, has not been terribly effective on this. They did send Vice President Kamala Harris down to Central America. We'll remember that she said, do not come. And she got a great deal of grief from the left. Mm -hmm. She didn't get much praise from the right, and I think it's because many folks on the right recognized they weren't listening. Okay. They don't believe her. We are out of time. Numbers matter. Yes, indeed. Okay. Your cross, Dr. Bernard, I'll give you six minutes because that's what they just took. Thank Go. you, Your Honor. Good evening, Mr. Garrity. Good evening. So you are a reporter for the National Review, that's correct? Well, as I said, senior political correspondent is the name I give at cocktail parties, but right. yes, reporter. <laughs> so you have been able to go and do some live reporting on the border, is that correct? I've been near the border, but I have not been at any of the border stations. Okay. And every time I've gone into the country, it's been legally. <laughs> well, and is the characterization that we have a police state at the border accurate? I think I need you to give a more clear definition of what you mean by police state. Well, from what you have observed at the border, is it a situation in which government is operating efficiently and with respect for the rights of all individuals involved? Oh, government efficiency. Yes. I think you have a fair criticism there. There are certain parts of the border that are very secure. I think it's very safe to say that our ports of entry, I'd say to say that the, uh, any place where you've got a highway, of course that's, uh, that's fairly secure. And then there are large stretches of space that are wide open. Now, if you asked me whether, you know, what would be needed to deal with that and to create a, an effective solution to that, I am not a fan of the Trumpian plan for a Great Wall of China, the wall just went 10 feet higher, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> we don't need that to go from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean. The uh, head of the Border Patrol Union has basically argued, we need about 350 miles more worth of fencing. And they're not expecting an absolute total impenetrable wall. I've heard the arguments that somebody can bring a ladder or something like that. Now, when I've seen the footage of people who are coming across the, across the border, they look very desperate, they look very hard. I have no doubt they've worked very hard to get there. I haven't seen them carrying ladders. I think it'll be okay. What the Border Patrol says is they need the fencing as a funnel to basically create, put them in few, fewer areas where they need to patrol, where they can more efficiently use their manpower. Okay. Now, you mentioned in your discussion with Mr. Elder the legal versus illegal immigration distinction. Now, is there also a distinction between individuals who come here to work hard and make a better life for themselves and individuals who come here to benefit from government programs such as refugee resettlement? 
Yeah, I think we'd I like to see everyone who comes to this country eventually, presuming they are physically and mentally capable of doing so, doing so. I think that work and uh, uh, trying to be independent is an important American value. We try not to encourage dependence upon government programs. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with providing those who are, you know, indisputably refugees and who are coming here desperate with very little beyond the shirt on their back. Okay. Well, but did I understand you correctly that you would like everyone who wants to come and be a part of America to be able to do that? To get in line and do it legally? Yes. How long should that line be? Well, if it's a lot of people, it's going to be a long line. I think if you ask every legal immigrant, was it worth the wait, they would say yes. And how long is that wait for most individuals? Oh, it's years. There's no doubt about it. You have to, you know, beside, you have to fill out a lot of forms. Background checks take time. And I would not want the government, with all of its admitted flaws, to rush through checking whether someone is part of a gang, part of a terrorist group, or has some sort of previous criminal convictions, or is there some other reason to think this person is going to harm Americans once they get here. Okay. And you mentioned that America is an accepting country, but that there, there's a reasonable expectation that individuals follow the rules. Now, may I ask your political party affiliation, or is that completely inappropriate for someone with your uh, I'm profession? Lived, I'm in the state of Virginia, so I, we're, there's no part registration by party. Uh, I'm an independent, at least I think of myself as an independent. Uh, I voted for the libertarian candidate in the last election, and in the previous year I voted for Egg McMuffin. Well, <laughs> Evan McMullen, pardon me. And of course, you know, the Republican Party was founded in 1854 in Wisconsin in specific opposition to the Fugitive Slave Act, correct? I'm not going to argue with on that. So would you say that it's inappropriate for a political party to have formed where its very first act was disagreeing with and opposing and violating a law that was passed by the federal government? Well, that's assuming that all laws are morally equivalent and the same, which I think is kind of nonsensical, and I don't think you'd want to make that argument. So what is the moral, so in terms of the immigration law's moral import, what is your best moral argument for the idea that we should be able to keep somebody out of the country if they just want to come and contract with an American to do work, or study at an American university, or participate in a mm -hmm. church or exchange program with Americans who mm -hmm. have consented to share their property rights with this individual? Every country on earth has borders that they try attempt to enforce. Every country on earth has legal immigration, some a great deal more than others, not as many as, as much as we do. And just about every country on earth uh, has programs designed to keep people out who they don't want to come into the country. But in terms of the so that actual- all, you know, Moral, it's, it's human. It's, it's a basic fact of life of being a nation. So basically everyone else is doing it. We can't think of anything better. Just like when everyone else was doing slavery and we couldn't think of anything better. I find it very unlikely, I would like to see some other countries go first and try to have open borders and have absolutely no enforcement. Let's see how that works out for them. Okay, what if we tried rolling back all of the distortions going back to, I believe uh, Dr. Elder mentioned the Reagan administration and some of the ways that we have transferred, we have created quotas where there you know, was supposed to be 60% of individuals accepted from certain parts of the world. What would be your perspective on simply rolling back all of those distortions in our immigration policy? I think that's a conversation worth having. I have no overall objection to that. I need to see the details of a proposal like that. I do hear the argument that it has prioritized unskilled labor over skilled labor, and uh, that if you allowed people in from other countries who had higher, uh, sometimes higher education levels or a more entrepreneurial spirit or reason to believe that they were gonna create one. Look, I, those are the kind of people we should be encouraging to get into the country legally. Well, it, in terms of what allows them to come on into the country legally, we are the ones who decide whether stepping across the border constitutes a crime in and of itself unless you have previously obtained government permission, right? That's accurate. Okay. I, I think no those are all my questions, okay. Your Honor. Thank you very much, Perfect and thank timing. you for your time, Mr. Garrity. All right. Very good. Right down to the second. <laughs> uh, Mr. Garrity, uh, are you by any chance performing Donald Trump interpretations, uh, 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 impersonations <laughs> later tonight down at the Comedy Central? <laughs> Because we're all, <laughs> by judge's orders, we demand you do more Trump. <laughs> You're pretty good. You even kind of got the look going there. A little more blonde hair, maybe? <laughs> okay, here we go. Mr. Elder, it's time for you to call your next witness. I call my next witness, John Jan Jekelnik, senior editor of the Epoch Times. Please. 
place your hand right here. I don't know, left, right, center. <laughs> All right, uh, do you swear, this by the way, is the case against immigration, the moral, economic, social, and environmental reasons for reducing US immigration back to traditional levels. So do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't know about swearing on this book, but I swear to tell the truth. There you have it. He said he will tell the truth. Close enough. <laughs> I think it's working. Mr. Jakelnik, tell us about your background. So I'm a senior editor with uh, the Epoch Times newspaper. Um, I have a show called American Thought Leaders. I've interviewed a number of experts on the border and related issues. And of course, we cover this issue extensively at the Epoch Times. Should we be worried about illegal aliens coming in through Mexico or through Canada who might be terrorists, drug dealers, criminals who are opposed to our American ideals? Um, well, let me uh, caveat this at the beginning with, uh, with the thought. I'm actually a child of immigrants. I'm first generation Canadian. Um, I was actually someone who was very, very pro-liberal uh, or open borders policy, not even four years ago. But watching what has happened, I'm going to answer your question directly in a moment. Um, I, I've actually changed that view, and in part, it's precisely because this is a huge problem. And uh, l l let me give you some idea of the problem. I mean, the, the big issue really is that the incentive structures have been changed, okay? The incentive structure has been changed. There's something called la invitation, which is uh, what basically the, the different um, migrants that have been interviewed by a number of the experts I've had on the show say, and that th th they understand that if they can get across the border with the help of these cartels, as you identified, Mr. Prosecutor, earlier, that basically they're in. And so this creates a situation where the entire border is overwhelmed. So I don't know about this characterization of a police state. I, it's almost, I think it's more like an anti-police state at the border where the, you know, literally in the, na in the words of a particular, um, uh, of, of a particular former border patrol chief, he says the cartels actually have operational control of the border. So in that construct, you know, we have a situation, you were, we were talking about uh, uh, terrorism, right? And so there's more than 250 migrants and this is, uh, that were on the FBI terror watch list since 2020 that have actually been apprehended, right? And remember, this is in the context where there's, you know, 1.2 million got so-called gotaways. So we have actually no idea how many more people on the terror watch list were actually came through. And you know, there's this there's this system in place that there's its terrorism screening database. This is the reason why we have border controls, and those people get screened out. It's actually very effective. It's one of the reasons why we in America have a lot fewer terrorist attacks than say in Europe, where such structures don't exist as well. So, to make a long story short, just on the on the terrorism side of things, I mean, this is this is a very very serious issue. In 2022, uh, there were 15 people on the terrorist watch list. That, got, that got, got apprehended. We have no idea how many came through. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out, uh, we've got well over a million so-called gotaways. Uh, so we have no idea how many got away who are on the terror watch list. That's right. We just, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned in my opening statement the impact that illegal alien has on uh, people living in the inner city, those with low skills uh, who have to compete against them for jobs. Uh, and because of the presence of illegal alien labor, they put downward pressure to the tune of around $1,800 per year on their salaries. Why does it, you suppose, the people that want open borders aren't concerned about that? You know, that, that's a fascinating question. Um, I, I don't, I, I've heard the argument that you made that there's political reasons <laughs> behind this, but you know, there's all sorts of statistics showing that basically the so-called so illegal labor in America is basically lowering wages for working class Americans. Um, I think there, recently there's this, I'll, I have a statistic here actually, um, you know, unemployment ab among black Americans rose 6% in a two month period right. um, as you know, this, this influx increased. That's a, that's a great example. I, can, I, can I comment a little bit about uh, the child trafficking issue, Please. because Please. I think this is one of the things that's the most
concerning to me of all. At the moment, and this is a, a wild statistic for everybody to, to know, there's actually 85,000 children um, that are unknown. They're, they've been released into America to people unknown, and it is not clear where they are. That is a, very, that is a real statistic. Um, so I recently interviewed a HHS whistleblower, Tara Rodas. You can look up her congressional testimony. Um, basically, she got put in, she volunteered. She was actually with the Inspector General's office, and she got volunteered to help with these uh, uni reuniting families, right? Re reuniting families with, um, with parents, ostensibly. And what she realized that in many cases, because of her eye, being in the IG office, she noticed all, of, all sorts of discrepancies, and she found numerous, numerous cases where children were being so-called reunited with people they didn't know, that what there were it? actual tra child, trafficking child trafficking operations that were being in play. Are we, are we, do we need to finish up? Uh, one minute. Uh, last question. Are you familiar with the MS-13 gang? Absolutely. The Southern Poverty Law Center uh, has done a study on MS-13 the ones located in Southern California, and they determined that they are literally targeting black residents there. Uh, these are people who are racist, who hate black Americans, yet they are somehow in the country, uh, largely because our borders are open, and they are targeting black residents. Uh, again, same question. Why is it you s suppose that open borders people aren't concerned about that? You know, <laughs> the, the case that I've heard, and this is, this is, it's the case that you made, that there's a, uh, that they are more concerned with votes than they are with humanitarian issues. And I sympathize, I just want to be clear, I sympathize deeply with all the migrants when they know that there's this opportunity. If they get across, they're, they're basically in. I understand a, why a lot of people would want to come, but that's, it's created a, a humanitarian disaster. Mm -hmm. And you understand that our asylum system uh, is for people who are persecuted for religious reasons or ethnic reasons, but not for people who are economic refugees coming for jobs, however honorable you might think somebody might be to do that for their family, that is not what our asylum system is for. Well, 100%, and I know, I know many people who have actually gone through the asylum system, and it takes a long time. It's a tough road, too. Okay. Thank right. you. All right, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Bernard, you're across. Thank I'll you very you much, six, Your Honor. A little over six minutes, go. We'll, we'll go to the law and crime it, okay, well, I'll speak faster. <laughs> speak faster. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here and for bringing your experience to the jury. So you mentioned that it was about four years ago that you changed your tune on the subject of open borders? Well, I would say more over the last four years as I've become aware of the realities at the border and the realities that you know Americans face as a result of the essentially an experiment in open borders as I view it. So would you describe the current policy of the United States as an open borders policy? Um, I, that, that is a good question. I don't know. Again, it comes back, back to these definitions, right? But I think that it's a much more open borders policy than we've seen in an incredibly long time. And, there, and this, this new policy, which basically allowed people, if, if you can get in, you're basically released into the country. I don't know, if that's not an open borders policy, I don't know what is. Okay. Well, you mentioned and, and you discussed, you know, things like the MS-13 gang and some of these other very dangerous cartel-funded organizations that are indeed wreaking havoc in our country as other places. Would you say that these are institutions that have sprung up following the drug war, or did they exist prior to the drug war? You mean like the, the MS-13 gangs and so forth? Well, they, they existed in, in South America, in El Salvador, for example but uh, they moved into America through some of these illegal immigration, uh, I guess, openings, so to speak. Yeah. Well, but in terms of what funds and provides the, and, and allows these dangerous organizations to exist, would you not agree that the black market for in these other restrictions that the United States has put into place is what allows them to continue existing both in their own countries as well as here in the United States? Objection, Your Honor. Question irrelevant. Well, I, I strongly I, disagree. I, I will allow it. Well, so I don't actually understand what you mean about black market. We're black market. We're talking about you know transnational organized crime. We're talking about human trafficking. We're talking about facilitation of pedophilia. We're talking about you know I think things that are absolutely antisocial in every way, and we wouldn't 
want to have legalized, a lot of what is happening is exactly that. Well, and you mentioned the child trafficking as well. Would you not agree that it is the immigration restrictions that cause parents from around the world to be willing to put their children into the custody of coyotes and others for the chance at a better life? And would not an immigration policy that allowed families to come together with their children reduce the opportunity for these vulnerable minors to be attacked and trafficked at the border? So I think actually some of them are probably the way you describe, but some of the evidence that Tara Rodas and others have uncovered shows that, this, that these children are actually being seized on the other side of the border by these transnational organized crime organizations and being shipped up to other, in, through intermediaries, up to people who actually traffic them further in America. Because of the open border situation, it makes that possible. Well, and to loop back to the, the drug war issue, we don't have transnational crime organizations around alcohol, do we? Um, not that I'm aware of. We have them around drugs that are found to be illegal by governments and they have added criminal justice penalties that sort of allow these markets for substances that consenting adults choose to engage in that forces them into the black market, right? I, I mean, I think some, some drugs, and then there's drugs like fentanyl, which have no business being out there. But right. you would agree that we have created a black market by what we have chosen to make illegal? Um, I, I think I would concede that. And if we have chosen to make it illegal to step foot across the border without government authorization, would we not reduce crime by simply not making that a crime and m making it a crime to hurt someone once you have stepped across the border or violate a contract your, your Honor, or lie question, to someone? Your Honor, the question implies if we stop making illegal immigration illegal, it no longer is illegal. Yeah, please reword. <laughs> So is there anything, is everyone who steps across the border causing harm to American citizens? No, I, I think a lot of the people that may, are stepping across the border are not causing uh, immediate harm, but they're ha causing harm in some of the ways that Mr. Prosecutor uh, outlined. But the, the issue is that a whole lot of them, uh, and because of this so-called operational control of the border that the cartels have, a whole lot of organized crime in a, of a sort that we actually need to be policed in any state is actually make it through, making, th making it through and flourishing, and that's what the data is showing us. Last question. I'll try to make it uh, not a compound question here, but so you say we, what we have had over the past four years or so has been more open borders than it was before, but it's still not a complete open borders policy. Is there any consideration that perhaps that the same people who have given us policies of control and coercion and destruction of American money and family and the working class might also be pushing a fake version of open borders that still contains a number of immigration restrictions but causes Americans to blame immigrants for their problems rather than the federal government? Short answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think I fully understand the question. I mean, we have situations where you know, for example, we know that Venezuela opened up its prisons to send those prisoners through the border to, to cause chaos in America. We have situations like that. Okay, right. thank you so thank much. You. you are excused. And Dr. Bernard, you may call your first. Yes, Def thank you, Your Honor. I call uh, Dr. Brian Kaplan to the okay. stage. Okay. And we will, we will be keeping it tight to five minutes. No we got to keep it tight. Tight and bright, baby. Here we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> You take that microphone, and I'll take that book. All right. That's very exciting. I can swear on myself. Great. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to beatbox. Hold that. There you go. Good. You hold that up, and you can. Okay. Please place your hand on this copy of Open Borders. It's your book. I was going to give you Immigrants Your Country Needs Some by Philippe Legrand, but uh, yours is fine. Um, Professor Brian Kaplan, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you Milton Friedman? I miss Milton. I will swear by him. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. Okay, here we go. Thank you. And Dr. Kaplan, could you please give the jury uh, your background, educational and professional? Uh, yes, I'm a professor of economics at George Mason University. I got my PhD in economics from Princeton. Please don't hold that against me. And I'm also the author of many books, including Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration. So you have studied uh, immigration from an economic perspective? 
from an economic perspective, political perspective, sociological perspective, uh, cultural perspective. I do it all. What can you tell us about the impact of immigration on the American economy? The main thing that immigration does is it moves people from low productivity countries to high productivity countries, and amazingly, the result is their productivity goes up enormously. Just think about how unproductive you would be if you were stuck being a lawyer in Haiti. By virtue of being in the US, your productivity is much higher. It turns out the same goes, uh, goes for Haitians too. As almost as soon as they show up, their productivity multiplies by a factor of five or 10 or 15. It is the most amazing result in all of economics. You really can take an illiterate Afghan goat herder and have his productivity multiply tenfold by having him work in an Afghan restaurant in the United States. You can well, see it with your own eyes. But does that have any negative consequences for Americans here and our property rights? All progress has negative consequences. The internet put travel agents out of business. The right question to ask is always, what is the best overall result? And the best overall result is allowing progress. Think about this. Uh, the secret of mass consumption is mass production. Rich countries are ones where we produce a lot of stuff. Whenever you're thinking about economic policy, you should always be thinking about what is best for production overall. This is why we are no longer going and doing agriculture with shovels. People did not worry that much. Well, could this put some farmers out of work? Sure, but it leads that we have a lot more food. Similarly, it is totally possible that if you let in a lot of foreign professors, this would put me out of a job if I didn't have tenure. Uh, but that's not the right question to ask about whether it hurts any particular person. The right question to say is, what does this do for our overall living standard? And for there, the answer is totally clear. Immigration is fantastic for overall living standard. Always remember, you're a consumer and a producer. You consume the products of so many immigrants that you don't even think about because they are doing you a service. How would you characterize the current state of immigration restriction in the United States, especially as regards the term open borders? Yes. We are in a system of draconian restriction with ridiculous propaganda claiming it's open. Let me put it this way. If the border was really open, would someone pay $5,000 to a coyote to get smuggled in? Have you ever paid $5,000 for something that was open? Of course not. And the coyote fees are much higher for people from countries that are further away. Actually, the system, in a sense, works. It keeps out an overwhelming majority of the people who'd like to come. I just say that that is a terrible goal because it is a good thing when people should move from countries where their productivity is low to countries where their productivity is high. It's not just good for them, it's good for us, their customers. Think about every product you've ever consumed from an immigrant and realize, wow, I would have had to go and settle for something worse if this person wasn't here. So is it your opinion that immigration, un, 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 more unrestricted immigration would lead to better economic outcomes for our entire country? It would lead to better overall outcomes. But like I said, all progress has negatives. You can have the internet and then you've got a kid who's checking Instagram all the time. You can either say, because of this problem, then I'm going to say, no, we're gonna stop progress. Or you can say, well, what's the overall effect? And yeah, overall, the internet has been awesome. I hope you'll agree, despite the fact that there are always complaints. And now, by the way, I just want to make one, one point. Uh, since you're at Freedom Fest, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm hoping that you don't trust the media. <laughs> and as well you should not, because do you know what the media does? They find the most horrifying rare events and show it to you to terrify you to take away your freedom. That is what the media does, and that really is what all of the complaints that Larry Elder was okay, talking Mr. about at the Kaplan, beginning were about. Okay, Mr. Kaplan, there is no lecturing here tonight. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and on, soon you will be replaced by Chad GPT as a professor. Okay. And on Last that question. note, I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Okay, all right. Thank you, Dr. Thank Kaplan. You. Okay, Mr. Elder. Your cross. Professor, you just swore your oath on a copy of Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. Uh, my own book, but sure. Okay. I swore by Milton. Okay. Do you know who said, quote, it is just obvious you can't have free immigration and state welfare? Uh, that's not the exact quote, but I believe you are trying to quote Milton Friedman. It's, it's in my book. It's verbatim. It it's is just obvious you can't have free immigration and a welfare state. Yes, that is the correct quote. You changed the quote. You know who said it? It is Milton Friedman, of course. Uh, Milton was wrong, as I say in my book. Do you believe there is a distinction between illegal immigration and legal immigration? Absolutely. I want there to be no illegal immigration because I want it to all be legal. So it's your view that if we just eliminate the word illegal, people come mm -hmm. in here 
and then all of a sudden they become legal and it's okay. Uh, that is correct. Wow. Do, 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 num do numbers matter? Mm -hmm. Numbers matter enormously, absolutely. I do not say that we should do this if it, if it leads to a disaster. I say we should do this because it well, would be well, defi awesome overall. Define, define disaster. Mm -hmm. Let's see. If there was a large decline in living standards, if there was a doubling of the murder rate, so, so, if there so was a civil so war, those are disasters. So, Professor, you're saying at some point it could lead to a decline in living standards. Mm -hmm. It is logically possible, but I say it would not. One, one, of, one of my witnesses pointed out in the last two months unemployment for blacks mm -hmm. have gone up. Do you think there's a relationship mm -hmm. between that and the illegal immigrations who are unskilled who mm -hmm. come into the country under the, Bush under the Biden administration? I don't even believe the numbers that he said. A 6% increase in unemployment for any major group is absurd, I don't, unless you, it's limited to one particular so you location. Don't, you don't believe Bloomberg when they reported mm -hmm. that the I, I last need, two I would need to see what the actual denominator was. I don't believe that the number reported was even accurate. Uh, again, like, is it possible that there could be a large increase in immigration leading to temporarily high unemployment? Sure, it has happened. Uh, for example, when Israel took in a lot of Soviet immigrants, there was a temporary large increase in unemployment. It went away because even in Israel, markets work well enough to integrate people into the labor market so that you can use their skills. Are you familiar with Professor George Borjas from Harvard? I've debated him, yes. And as you know, he says that there are winners and losers behind illegal immigration. I uh, say the and, same thing. And the biggest, and the biggest uh, winner are those who want cheap labor. The biggest mm -hmm. losers are those in the inner city, as I mentioned earlier, who mm -hmm. are black, uh, who are competing against them for jobs, mm -hmm. and who otherwise would be higher, on, higher working, higher employment, uh, and would have higher wages. Do you accept his assertion about that? Uh, I don't know if that's exactly accurate, but I don't take that as true, no. Do you think that people in this country should be the ones to determine the amount of illegal, of legal and illegal immigrants we have in the country, or should some, something else determine that? I think, should, people, should, I think people should have their freedom. So who yes, if the people think there shouldn't be freedom, I say freedom anyway. Let me rephrase the question. Do you, do you, think, do you think Americans living in this country should determine who comes to the country and, and the number of people coming into the country? Should that no, be Americans? I do not. So when the Constitution gives the, gives the government the power to determine whether or not states have been invaded, you don't agree with that? Yes, an invasion is not the same as immigration. This is just well, demagoguery. When, when Jay Johnson, Obama's DHS secretary, says, mm -hmm. I have a good day mm -hmm. if we have fewer than 500 illegals. Mm -hmm. I have a bad day when we have more than 500 to 1,000. We're having 5,000 per day, Professor. You don't consider that to be an invasion? If they are not coming here with weapons to kill us, of course not. What about the ones who are in the terror watch list? Mm -hmm. What about the ones who are bringing in drugs? Uh, you remember what I was just saying about finding extremely rare, emotionally affecting cases and then using it to take away our freedom? Well, that is what you're it doing. Only, it only took 19 illegal aliens to do 9-11, Professor, mm -hmm. out of 350 mm -hmm. million people living in the country. Yes. So a small number can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is totally possible. However, that still came out to only less than 1% of all the murders over the last 20 years. Again, like, if you just think about TSA, right, for all of us to have to suffer for such a small number of problems, uh, it is the kind of thing that appeals to status, but it's a bad idea. Well, it's much we, better to take our chances, we, live free. We wouldn't have a TSA if, unfortunately, a small number of people mm -hmm. didn't hijack planes, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we had, it, well, we had something very similar before, as you know. Ah, uh, yes, if there were no one did anything bad, then probably we wouldn't have TSA, but guess what? Uh, you, well, can go, you can ride on European if, trains without if, actually needing to be searched. If, if, Are if, there some more terrorist attacks there? Yeah, but it's no, way better if, to just if, go if, on if a train If no one did anything search. bad, we wouldn't need, need to have laws. We wouldn't need to have hmm? judges and courts hmm? and jails. I mean, what, what does do? this have to do with what I'm talking about? But, but we about? do have them. Hmm? Sure. Do you, do you think hmm? it's relevant whether or not hmm? an illegal, a number of illegal, illegal aliens change the culture of a country? Hmm? Uh, is it relevant? Yes. Uh, it's relevant. Again, what I would say is the culture of America isn't that great to begin with, as you might recall. Just think about all the people who would never come to Freedom Fest. The, country, the so. culture of America isn't that great to begin with? <laughs> yes, so... Which is why they're coming into the country, because the culture is not they're coming great here to begin with. Because of the economy, of course. They want to get jobs, and this is the great strength of our country. Our economy still works well. All yeah. right, thank you, Mr. Elder. That was a great cross. All right, we are down to our last witness. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Uh, my next witness will be Dr. Jacob Hornberger. Hello, Dr. Jacob Hornberger. Oh, you have your own book. Oh, this is so exciting. Everyone's got their cell literate and published. 
please place your hand upon the case for free trade and open immigration. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you Ludwig von Mises? I certainly do. Ah, oh, well done. All right, you keep your book. <laughs> All right, here we go. Five minutes. Hey, good evening, Dr. Hornberger. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and give them your background? Wait, we get microphone, oh God, microphone. The mic, sorry. I'm Jacob Hornberger. I uh, went to College of Virginia Military Institute where I got an economics degree. I got a law degree at the University of Texas, practiced law for several years, and 34 years ago I founded the Future of Freedom Foundation, which is a nonprofit educational foundation devoted to libertarianism. And do you have any personal experience with living on the border or the immigration situation from your own life? Yeah, I grew up on, in Laredo, Texas on a farm on the Rio Grande where we hired illegal immigrants and I have spent almost half my life on the border and I'm pretty familiar with what the two witnesses for the prosecution are obviously not familiar with and that's the police state that exists down there for people that live along the border. I've had personal experience with that police state. And what can you tell us about that situation at the border, as well as anything about the legal way that those zones have been expanding further and further into the rest of the United States? Well, I mentioned that I grew up on a farm. We had Border Patrol coming onto our farm whenever they wanted. And they, if we put a lock on our gate, they would shoot off the, the, the lock without a warrant. They would bust our workers. We hired illegal immigrants. They were the high, hardest working people we've ever, I've ever seen. On the highways, going outside Laredo and running east-west in Arizona and New Mexico, they have fixed highway checkpoints that subject travelers to warrantless searches. They have those in Cuba, too, because I've been to Cuba, and they have the exact same thing. And then they have roving Border Patrol checkpoints where the Border Patrol stops whoever they want. That is precisely what a police state is all about, and I got stopped by one of those when I was in high school. Well. And so in, in your experience and your subsequent study, does this match up with the ideals of the American Republic that we all cherish and hold dear? It is the exact opposite of our heritage and our legacy. We had 100 years of open immigration in this country, and it was the greatest system in the world. There was no death. I mean, notice that the two prosecution witnesses and the prosecutor here has not mentioned the most important factor in their system, the massive death toll that comes about, the suffering that comes about with their system. Our system of open immigration that we had for 100 years, there was no death, there was no suffering. It was the greatest, most prosperous nation in history, precisely because you had the system of open immigration. And now, when you describe the open border system that you support, are you describing a situation in which immigrants should receive welfare or state benefits or otherwise be able to violate the property rights of Americans? Absolutely not. That is, is, is Catherine has said and as Brian said, immigration is not citizenship. Nobody should be guaranteed a citizenship, but people should be guaranteed the right to come over here, work, invest, tour, visit, but don't take advantage of any of the welfare state uh, policies. But I'm a libertarian. I say let's focus on getting rid of the welfare rather than destroying the freedom of both the American people and the foreigners. And do you also advocate um, where should we put the accountability for any problems with the administration of benefits and if, if any illegal immigrants did receive benefits? Should we hold them responsible? Should we hold the government responsible? Well, obviously the government, but keep something in mind here about these public benefits. Notice that it's always the government that complains about too many customers. Do you see Walmart or Home Depot or Amazon complaining about too many customers? It's only the public sector that does that. And I say the solution to that is get the government out of the areas it doesn't belong, like education and health care and other areas. I'll, I'll rest on that okay. and pass the witness All to right. Mr. Elder. Thank you very much, Dr. All Hunberger. right. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. Mr. Elder, your cross. Go. Mr. Hornberger, you say that you grew up on a farm. That's correct. Did your farm have fences? It did. Why? Because we wanted to mark it off from the adjoining farms, which were privately owned, just like ours. Uh, the fences were not there to make sure that people did not intrude or trespass on your property? Well, yeah, it was to mark it off from the adjoining ranch so that we would know what our boundaries were. Between so it, the wasn't, two. it wasn't an open farm? That's correct. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you mentioned that 100 years ago we had open borders. Correct. Would you agree that 100 years ago it was harder to get here than it is today? Absolutely not. Not on the southern border. Really? Absolutely. On the southern border, it was the same situation. So just in, the over. in the last year or so, we've had people from the southern border coming up from over 150 countries. You think it was as easy 100 years ago for 150 countries to come up to the southern border as it is today? It was actually easier because you didn't have all of these cartels and gangs that were raping people and stealing from people and, and attacking people because of the system of immigration controls. They would do the legal way, like in a carriage or a horse or what have you. I have a difficult time believing that it was easier 100 years ago to come here than it is today from 150 different countries. Talk to the people that are coming up from Honduras and El Salvador that are getting raped and, and killed and, and massacred on the way up here. That yep. didn't go on when we had a system of open borders. There was just a free flow of people, just a natural flow. Do you believe numbers matter? In what respect? Do you believe that at some point, if part of the 8 billion people in the world come to America that the benefits no longer are outweighed by the downsides? I, I, I say let free markets operate. Right now... So, so let's just do it and find out what happens? Absolutely. Keep our fingers, keep Look, our fingers crossed? You have an open border between Texas and on the, on the west side, and you have tons of Californians coming in. When you talk about Californians, they're gun grabbers, they're welfare statists, there's a lot of violent people, terrorists. They flood into Texas. We don't call for abolishing the, the I mean, for erecting border controls between California and Texas, but not everybody moves. That's the way it is internationally. Not everyone moves. People like their countries, but you attract the people that are the industrious, the, the ones that want to work hard, that want to make money. Those are a gift to society, Larry. They're not a burden. Do you believe, do you believe that illegals commit more crime compared to people who come to the country legally? I don't know, but it doesn't make any difference. Doesn't because, make any difference? No, of course not, because you want to lock out everybody because of a small minority of violent people. I didn't people. say lock out everybody. You I'm in favor of legal immigration, not illegal immigration. That's right, but that's a socialist immigration control system where you've got the government making that determination. Is there, I'm is saying, there, is there a country where the government does not make that determination that you know of? The United States in the 19th century? Is there a country does not make that distinction that you know of today? today? Yes. No, they're all alike. America ended up copying the rest of the world. I say, let's lead the world in the area of freedom. Your, 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 book, your book is called The Case for Free Trade and Open Immigration. Is there a distinction between the two, free trade and open immigration? There's no distinction whatsoever. The free movements of goods, services, and people, just like we have domestically. So the free movement of goods and services is the same as the free movement of people? Absolutely. Are you familiar with what's going on right now in Paris, the riots that are taking place? The what? The riots that are taking place. Not you, real familiar. I'm, I'm aware of the riots. I don't know the root cause. Uh, and a uh, Muslim immigrant uh, was killed by the police uh, in a way that a lot of Muslims in Paris believe was unlawful or wrong and they are rioting, burning, tearing, looting. Um, do you think there's an issue with the inability of some of these people who've come to France, who are from Muslim countries, to integrate into that society? Well, yeah, but a lot of it's government barriers that prevent them from integrating into that society. You know, work re permit requirements and that sort of thing. If you get rid of that, it makes it much more easier for people to assimilate. And well, there are, the there, are, there are some people, Professor, uh, Mr. Hornberger, who um, believe, for example, that you should convert to, to Islam, and if you don't convert to Islam, you should pay a tax, and if you refuse to do it, you should be killed. Some percentage of the people who are living in Paris feel that way, and if they feel that way, is that a problem for the society of France in general? Look, we've talked about culture here. Our culture here in the United States is one of liberty. People should be free to believe and advocate any religion they want. The minute they cross a line and initiate violence or force, that's the purpose of government. Go after them, target them, prosecute them, incarcerate them, and punish them. But up to that point, leave people free to believe whatever they want to believe. Okay, we are out of time. All right, thank you. Was that dynamite or what? Oh, my God. That was insane. Good wow. Job. Thank you, Mr. Those were great arguments. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's up to you now to decide. Oh, we got eight minutes to finish. So you can take five minutes to decide, and your foreman will take your vote. So you're going to vote now.
on, on uh, who had the better arguments. Not just barely better, but um, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Bernard is absolutely guilty and should be punished for her position, or is if uh, if if she had the the better arguments Paper? for more open borders, what so you you're going to vote oh. on that now. Two minutes. two minutes. Okay, I think we had eight minutes to go, but two minutes to go, whatever. Larry has an interview to Oh, Larry has an interview. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. We we yeah, we got our votes coming up here now. Okay, here we go. So again, we all just need the majority. We don't need a complete what, this one? consensus. Oh. We're doing the count now. Do you need a pen? Oh. That was fast. You guys don't play around. Mm -mm. I believe it. Maybe some of the handwriting was difficult to read. <laughs> okay, you ready? All right, Dr. Bernard, please stand and face the jury. Mr. Foreman, please tell us what the outcome was. Did you say not guilty? All right. Thank you. Dr. Bernard, Thank you, you and your supporters your of Open Borders have been found not <laughs> Thank guilty. You and are therefore given a free first-class airplane ticket to New York City to enjoy a week-long vacation in the Big Apple, including a tour of the Statue of Liberty, as well as free tickets to the new Broadway hit musical, Americano, about immigrants who came to the United States to find their future and fortune and live the American dream. Case closed. Congratulations. Thank you, jury. Thank you, Mr. Elder. Thank you for coming. All right. Good night. God bless America. <laughs>